I'm going to go ahead and start. Can everybody hear me okay? I just not use the mic. Oh, do I have to use the microphone? Talk to the audience. Can you guys hear me okay? Yes. I can hear you okay. Okay. Well, I'm not going to use it. Because okay. what happens with this microphone, you go in and out for a Keep it right up there. Um, are you bringing up the presentation? I am. I'm going to bring it up. In the meantime, could you introduce uh, Eric's speaker? Yes, I will do that. Do I need the button? Anyway, um, along with our advisory committee, we are being uh, assisted in our efforts at our advisory committee meetings by Kearns and West. And Kearns and West are here tonight, or representatives of Kearns and West, Eric Ponsole and, and Cece Vu who have really been helping us run, these, run the advisory committee's meetings, get organized, get organized three or four months in advance, and really help us uh, uh, work through the whole process. Um, I guess I can stay over here. So tonight, the, the idea is that we are going to talk about um, projects, what's been going on. There's been a lot going on. We haven't just been sitting around waiting to have a groundwater sustainability agency. We've been working on water supply projects uh, for years, either as a region or as individual agencies. So we wanted to give uh, the, the board and also the advisory committee at the same time a sense of what's going on sort of in parallel, actually preceding this effort and now in parallel with these efforts uh, that the advice that we will be working on with our groundwater sustainability plan and that there's going to be some convergence as we identify projects and as we develop the implementation plan. So I'm going to give a brief review of the, uh, the prior efforts, and then Rosemary and Ron are going to go into more details in terms of what the city and what the Soquel Creek Water District are doing. And Rosemary's going to talk a little bit about how that comes back and ties into our, um, our groundwater sustainability planning process and then there'll be opportunity for uh, some public input, some suggestions as to projects that maybe we should be considering that maybe we haven't, or just some suggestions, and then an opportunity for board discussion and discussion, including the advisory committee and, and, uh, and going forward. So it's, it's basically an informational uh, meeting tonight. We're not asking the board to take any action. Uh, but we're trying to get uh, to provide the information and the context for you as, as we go forward in this process. Um, so, the county and the local water agencies really have been working together uh, since the 1950s. And there, there's a more detailed PowerPoint presentation in your packet. We sort of, you know, so I'm just trying to summarize the key points of that here, but there are more details on this in your packet. The early studies really focused on reservoirs and water storage. The later studies realized that maybe reservoirs weren't such a great idea. Let's look at ground, use of groundwater, let's look at water conservation, and let's look at development of supplemental supplies, but a lot more emphasis on groundwater storage. Uh, for Mid-County, the overdraft and the threat of seawater intrusion was actually recognized in the first USGS report in 1968. And interestingly, recycled water and desalination was considered as early as 1960s. I didn't realize that until we went back and looked at some of the, uh, some of the old studies. Um, the county's first water master plan, 1957, identified a whole bunch of different reservoirs. And then there were subsequent updates to that water master plan. Um, some of you may have been around back in the 1980s. That's when we got everybody together to do the North uh, County Water Master Plan. Both the land use agencies and the water agencies all met together in the Civic Auditorium. It was quite the, uh, quite the event. The, the, they contributed money, they developed a plan, and then it pretty much went on a shelf, it seems like. We still weren't quite ready to start working together, but in about the late 1990s, early 2000s, we really did start to work together in earnest in a meaningful way, the various agencies talking together and work looking for, for regional projects. Um, one of the big ones was SC, SCWD squared, Squid squared the collaboration between the City of Santa Cruz and Soquel Creek Water District on the uh, desalination project. 
our integrated regional water management plan pulled together uh, water supply, storm water, environmental protection, conservation issues, and put, put it all together into one place. Um, and out of that came some of these stormwater recharge projects that we've done on a, on a small scale. And we're continuing these regional efforts. We're continuing to look, work together, cons consult with each other, and look for opportunities for regional collaboration. In the Mid-County area, of course, we had the Basin Implementation Group that was formed in 1995, Soquel Creek Water District and Central Water District. The Soquel Aptos Groundwater Management Committee brought in the um, City of Santa Cruz and the County of Santa Cruz. And then we formed the Mid-County Groundwater Agency in 2016. This is just a map showing the uh, six different reservoirs that were suggested throughout the county. Um, and one of them was developed. The uh, Lock Mill Creek Reservoir, Lock Loman Reservoir, was the only one that was developed. The other ones were all on the books. Um, some of them were carried over into subsequent water supply plans. Uh, but we haven't seen too much progress on those more recently. Um, City of Santa Cruz did develop the Lock Lowen Reservoir. That was somewhat of a regional project. Santa Ana Valley Water District has a piece of the yield of that reservoir. Uh, but it's primarily a City of Santa Cruz project. And then the city also developed the Felton Diversion Dam. And interestingly, with the exception of the Scotts Valley Recycled Water Facility, that really seems to be the last water supply project that's been developed in, this, in the northern part of the county. 1977, that's a long time ago. Um, we've been working on managing what we have more efficiently, drilling more wells, moving our wells around, but we really haven't developed any new water supply. Um, the city went through a series of water supply plans, looking at more details of what they could do. And most recently, um, the Water Supply Advisory Committee uh, brought together numerous diverse interests and laid sort of the groundwork for the city to move ahead. And you're going to hear more about that from Rosemary. Soquel Water District, again, 1968, the U.S. Geo Geologic Survey to the first characterization of the Mid County Basin, the Soquel Aptos Basin, and actually identified uh, the threat of overdraft at that time. There were some other reports that came out in the 1980s that the USGS did uh, that were a little bit contradictory, um, but then we moved on ahead. Soquel Creek uh, District formed a public advisory committee that developed the first draft integrated resources plan, a process very similar to our advisory committee that we have here. Um, and then that plan also was updated uh, in a series of years. Um, SoCal also participated with Central in developing the first groundwater management plan, the AB3030 plan, for this basin. Um, and then most recently in 2015, the district worked with the community to develop the community water plan and is now implementing the, uh, the various aspects of that. So that's it for the overview. Um, and I forget who's on next. Are you going to do it? Um, I don't know. I thought I was on the gym next. Sure. You could be next. <laughs> <laughs> I'm happy to let you be. <laughs> All right. Um, thanks, John. That was a really good overview, and I heard a lot of really good comments about the document that's in the packet, which gives a lot of details about that and shows that this is we do have a long history of working together and working uh, as individual agencies on water supply issues. So the fact that we're all here doing it again, I guess. Um, maybe that's a good thing to think that we'll all be smarter this time we can actually get something done or hopefully this is not just the 2015, 18, 20 version of the thing that will be on this thing the next time. So what, what I want to talk about a little bit is what our water supply augmentation strategy is. It came out of the Water Supply Advisory Committee and I want to give you a little bit of background about that and some uh, updates on where, quick updates on where we are with implementation. So let's see if I know how to work this. No, that's Button a pointer. The right. All right. All right. So we had a 14-member uh, city council appointed water supply advisory committee. They met from April of 2014 to October of 2015. They were a very diverse group, and they were citizens much like the folks in the um, 
and the advisory committee, the Groundwater Sustainability Plan Advisory Committee coming together, they had, you know, different levels of understanding and so they learned really a lot and they did really a great job of putting their arms around what the issues were and what a strategy was for going forward. Um, among the things that, that we developed during that planning process and that has since been reflected in our urban water management plan from 2015 is the fact that uh, Santa Cruz's water demand for the next 20 years is flat, slightly declining. And it's flat and slightly declining for three reasons. One is uh, existing on the books building and plumbing code um, changes that will require for remodels, new development, what have you, uh, a uh, more efficient fixtures. The second one is price elasticity of demand that was built into this forecast to recognize the fact that we're going to be raising our water rates, we have raised our water rates, and that's going to affect demand, particularly in the peak season when, you know, there's more discretionary use. And then the third thing was a little bit of additional, not a little, 200 million gallons of additional uh, water conservation from programmatic conservation over the 20 year period. So a lot of that conservation work is uh, in place and ongoing and I'm not going to talk too much about that tonight because um, that, that's a detail that I'm happy to talk about but doesn't sort of rise to the occasion of some of the things we're talking about um, here tonight. Can you speak up please? Oh sure. All right. Is this better? No. <laughs> You have to get a really close for it to work. Well, it wasn't on. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So uh, another thing is that the in the projected worst year drought, uh, given historic hydrology and some projections about climate change, the the gap that we have to fill is big. It's 1.2 billion gallons off of about a three and a 3.2 billion gallon estimated uh, annual demand for our whole system. So this graph shows basically our various sources, the key is over there, and you can see that in the worst case kind of situation, which for us historically is 1977, 2014 was pretty darn close, uh, we do not have enough water to reliably meet demand through um, the, the peak season. In fact, our reservoir is depleted, highly depleted during that situation. Um, so the problem statement that the Water Supply Advisory Committee came up with and that we've been working with is there, the, the main problem is we have limited storage. We're a surface water system that uh, is affected by low precipitation in the kinds of situations like we had in 2014 and 2015 and we get into trouble pretty darn fast, but once we get reasonable rains, normal rains, we get right back out of it. Um, and but the limited storage is a really big problem for us, for, particularly for multi-year droughts. Uh, we have a major commitment to fish flow requirements on all of our surface water sources, the San Lorenzo River, the North Coast sources, and we are implementing those, uh, those uh, fish flows, and that is making a big dent in our supply also. Um, we have this big gap, and water conservation alone is not enough to solve this problem. I think that was a really important uh, kind of conclusion that the Water Supply Advisory Committee came to because uh, in historically we've had a lot of we've had a lot of great success with conservation and so the sense was well more of that will solve the problem but unfortunately that doesn't actually work we we haven't tapped it out but we've done a lot in that and we can't fill the kind of gap that we have at 1.2 billion gallons a year with conservation. Um, we did several things, I think I mentioned in the, in the memo that's in the packet, that we did a very thorough and um, highly public review of many options for looking at supply. This was uh, the 2016, October 2014, excuse me, uh, water supply convention. There were over 40 different projects of different kinds of water supply alternatives that were showcased in this event. And following that, with, uh, with these 40 plus a bunch more, we looked at over 100 alternatives of different configurations, different uh, parts of the, you know, various reuse approaches, for example, pot potable, non-potable reuse, desal, uh, sort of the regional desal with the deep water desal kinds of things versus the local ones, you know, gray water decentralized systems, river catchments, those kinds of things. So it's been, it was a very thorough process and we ended up with a set of recommendations involving implement additional conservation. Look at the possibility of 
what's called sort of winter water harvest. There's more flow in the system in the winter time than is used to meet current demand or fish flows. Can we capture some of that and store it either passively through in lieu service to some of our neighboring utilities that use groundwater? They'll stop pumping their wells and water levels will rise and then we could get some of that back in a drought event. Or active storage through aquifer storage and recovery. And so we have been working on these two as well as the alternatives to that, to the river water harvest, which are recycled water and desal. And the proposal is to have apples to apples comparable, comparable information uh, in 2020 so that the city can make a decision about which project or portfolio of projects would make sense for us to meet our water supply needs for the next you know, increment. Um, so, just in terms of implementing, I want to talk a little bit about some of the assumptions. I know there's been a lot of, uh, several of you have heard about water transfers and water exchanges and some possibilities there. So I want to kind of talk a little bit about some of the assumptions we're working on and the, uh, the background about what we're taking into account as we're doing our evaluations. Um, we are looking at the possibility for in-lieu transfers and exchanges and the difference between transfers is transfers is one way we don't expect to get anything back exchanges is we give something and then we create a water bank for us that we could get back at a later date um, we've looked at all of the jurisdictions that we're contiguous to in one form or another um, we're looking at these sort of average winter storage um, volumes we know these are a little bit lower now because um, most of us have had some kind of a depression of demands, particularly winter demands based on the 2014-2015 restrictions that were in place. But this was the sort of total that we've been looking at, four and a half million gallons a day of demand that if we met then we could potentially build some storage for our drought supply in um, those kinds of volumes. Um, aqua storage and recovery is taking winter water, treating it to drinking water quality, putting it down by actively injecting it into a well, um, creating kind of a bubble of water, and then in drought events, taking that water out of regional aquifers. And so we've been doing quite a bit of work on that as well. Um, I wanted to talk a little bit more about the assumptions that we've used in some of the analytical work on the in lieu and the ASR options. So uh, we are assuming, again, until we have better pilot test work to document one way or another, that we would be able to return 80% of whatever we put in the ground, either passively or actively. That all available flows um, within existing water rights, in excess of fish flow requirements, and Santa Cruz demands may be diverted year round. So it's whatever is available, and the way that the modeling work is done for this, it's a 70 plus year rec of record. So it's every year it's looked at and then we come up with kind of an average that you could depend on. Obviously the worst years you can't divert much here, but um, in the worst years there might be some water. Uh, and that year round, uh, so we're basically taking everything there is to harvest in the system within our existing water rights and uh, within the fish flow constraints, some of the constraints of existing infrastructure and water rights requirements like the 20 CFS requirement for diversions from Felton and we're diverting that into storage and I'll tell you in a minute kind of where that gets us. Um, I'm, I'm not going to go through these in detail. I think there's a handout there and there's plenty of extras if people want to see these, but these are additional assumptions that we've used in developing the analysis for INLU and ASR. Um, we've been allowing three years to fill the basin, so to the three billion gallons, and you'll see in a minute uh, a graph that shows kind of how that would work under a kind of a five-year scenario with two years of drought at the back end. And we've, we've refined the magnitude of the problem looking at multi-year droughts. So in a um, assuming historical flows and the two-year worst-case drought, which for us was 76, 77, the, the worst year shortage is about that 1.2 billion, but the two-year shortage is 1.9 billion. So you need a bigger supply to get you through, um, bigger amount of water and storage to get you through a two-year drought. In our climate change scenarios, which we've developed, 
The worst year drought is a three-year drought. It's not quite as bad in the single worst year, but the three-year drought is two and a half billion gallons shortage. So it's a, that longer, the longer it goes with the limited storage that we have in our system, the size of the shortage gets bigger. Um, this is the graph I was, gonna, I was mentioning, looking at kind of how we would jointly operate the, the groundwater storage and the reservoir storage. The reservoir storage is the red line, so, you know, fills and, and empties and what have you. In the three years, we're diverting water to fill the storage, and then you can see that once you get into the drought of 76, 77, for example, the reservoir storage comes down and the aquifer storage comes down. And that's how we use those two uh, conjunctively to help meet our long-term needs in that situation. Um, so the conclusions of the work that we've done, and this work has been presented at the Water Commission, it's been presented at the Soquel Creek Water District, um, are basically in the two-year drought scenario. Um, in lieu alone, can't meet our needs because the demand that we would fill with just in lieu doesn't make enough supply for us to, the demand we'd offset doesn't make enough supply for us to um, get what we need during the drought event. Uh, ASR would need, uh, you know, would meet our needs and a combination of ASR and in lieu would meet our needs. One of the, um, the purposes of this work, and you'll see the climate change um, uh, act, you know, the same slide here next, but the purpose of this work is also to help us evaluate the sizing of the infrastructure. How many injection wells or how much injection well capacity do we need? Um, how much withdrawal capacity do we need to meet the, whatever the size of the gap is? And so that's what the 5 MGD of injection, 4.5 MGD of withdrawal under the ASR scenario is. And you can see that um, because you're only uh, all the, the limited amount of water that's actually in the aquifer that you can take out and the in lieu only strategy is why the amount of um, supply there is, uh, the MGD withdrawal capacity is smaller. This is the climate change scenario. You can see again that the injection capacity changes a little bit, but the withdrawal capacity is bigger because the size of the gap is bigger. And again, in this situation, in lieu only can't solve the problem, but a combination of either in lieu and or ASR um, will solve the problem, according to this analysis. Um, so the current status of in lieu is that we're planning for uh, work with Soquel in some kind of a, a transfer to Soquel that began in the winter of 1819. I think there was a presentation earlier this week of the results of the water quality compatibility analysis between surface water and groundwater. There are some other issues to iron out, but if it rains this winter, we should be in a position to open the valve at the O'Neill pump station and send water to Soquel and try this on a full-scale testing for at least uh, the 300 acre feet that is in the existing agreement. That we have ability to change that agreement, additional CEQA, um, work would need to be done and obviously uh, to do that. We're continuing discussions with other agencies about ongoing interest in water transfers, and water exchanges at SoCal, uh, Scotts Valley and San Lorenzo Valley Water District. And then we're working to refine the groundwater modeling uh, to help us really understand the benefits to the aquifer of this kind of a strategy plus the um, what water we could depend on to get be returned to Santa Cruz because it can't be just about the benefits to the aquifer for us. We have to also solve the problem that we have, which is we need water in storage or we need another source that would meet our drought supply. Um, so an aquifer storage and recovery, we've completed a phase one technical analysis that looked at a whole range of parameters that need to be met and there are no fatal flaws in any of that work. Um, we've performed system modeling to assess the availability of water for AF ASR and infrastructure sizing. You've seen some of the results of that. And then we're setting up to pilot test uh, active injection, at least in the Belts Wells, uh, Belts 12 probably this winter, 
and also um, hoping to find a location up in the Santa Margarita where we can uh, get going. We don't have a well up there that, that belongs to us, so a little bit hard to ask someone to take a well offline and give it to you so you can try aquifer storage and recovery when it's one of their operating wells. They're not very cooperative with that, I don't get it. Um, and then um, we're, gonna, we're continuing to work on groundwater modeling, so there's quite a bit of work going on looking again at how these aquifers would respond to uh, this kind of activity and whether that would contribute to the return to sustainability of some of these aquifers. Um, we do have a recycled water study we've just finished. We're looking at a variety of um, about 40 alternatives of potable and non-potable reuse. Um, the, it's finished and we've uh, submitted to the state. There are two small projects, non-potable reuse, that are being recommended and potable reuse options are continuing to be evaluated. So we're not where Soquel is on their potable reuse uh, project, but we are looking at, you know, we're continuing to look at this option. Um, this is a, a graphic showing the two big basins, Santa Margarita Basin and the Soquel, or the Santa Cruz Mid-County Basin. The water districts are shown there, and there's been some a whole variety of different analytical things looking at how you could use recycled water in our system to help meet our water supply, drought supply needs. Um, there's more information about this. Um, again, we can talk more about it if you have questions. These are the two small projects, La Barranca Park, which is right above our wastewater plant. We're looking at a bulk water station there and switching that park over to recycled water, non-potable, tertiary treated wastewater basically for irrigation. And then we're looking at a possibility of a pipeline that would take recycled water, tertiary treated wastewater up to um, UCSC to use for irrigation. They also have a number of buildings that have dual plumbing so that they could use that water for toilet flushing, for example. Um, neither of these produce enough of a demand offset to, by themselves, make much of a difference in the um, size of the problem that we have to solve, but they might make sense to do, they do make sense to do it anyway. Um, finally, we've looked at seawater desal, and we've done a, um, John mentioned that there was a um, study that the city and, and Soquel were working on a number of years ago that got paused, and then the Water Supply Advisory Committee uh, work happened. But we were looking at uh, updating in some of the basic assumptions about that desal project, and um, with a focus on sort of cost, timeliness, and change conditions. One of the biggest changes in the conditions is a requirement by the Coastal Commission and the State Water Resources Control Board and the Regional Water Quality Control Board, all heavy hitters, um, that you need to use subsurface intakes for seawater desal unless you can prove they're not feasible. And there's no definition for what's feasible and not feasible. So it's a little bit of a bring me a rock. No, I don't like that rock. Bring me a different rock. Um, but the work on this update of the basic um, desal project that we've had and the, kind of some changes to it based on what the definition of our current needs are is going to be uh, completed next month and it's going to be presented to the Water Commission. So there'll be more information on that. Um, so the finding for the desal project is it could produce the amount of water that we need to meet the worst year shortages. Um, costs are refined based on changing conditions and of course they got bigger. And the timeliness of implementation of this project is a big deal. It's probably not feasible to get done in the window that we're trying to reach, which is to have a supplemental supply online by 2025. Um, so this is just my closing slide to give you a little bit of additional work that we're going to do. I'm not going to go through um, all of this because you can sort of see it here, but it's we're actively working to bring forward these three options with a lot of detail that will be uh, presented to the Water Commission and the community in a very public uh, process that will then make some recommendations to the City Council in 2020. So we've got a lot of work to do, but um, we've been making really good progress, and I'd be happy to take your questions when the time comes. Yeah, go ahead. Thank you.
to the, to, the, to to the everybody in this row and then the second row and then um, there's there's copies for the public. So what you're this is a copy of my presenta our presentation that we're, we're showing here. As Melanie does that um, uh, and we, we get set up, we'll give ourselves a minute. I have here the first bottling of purified water in the Western Hemisphere. I actually have three bottles, but I forgot my water bottle, so I've almost drank one. So I'm going to give, uh, we'll, we'll do a contest, and the first one to get it right. How much groundwater does um, Santa Cruz use How, in percentage? Can anybody give me a number? Want to win a bottle? Is it? From? Santa Cruz, City of Santa Cruz, their groundwater supply it supplies how much versus surface water? Is it 458 feet Well, let's give it in percentages. Like we can't. Okay, five percent. That's it. That's it. We're going to go to John Kennedy here. Uh, and then, uh, how much uh, Soquel Creek Water District? How much uh, surface water does it use for is supplied by it? How much surface water it can? Is in it? Over here. Over here. Zero. Soquel Creek Water District was developed as a flood control agency. That's why it has its name Creek in there, but it's actually 100% groundwater. So, let's see. Okay. So, uh, we're going to present basically the, our community water plan, which the district developed in conjunction with our, our community. Here is our staff and a couple board members there. What's the problem? It's overdraft. We're designated as a critically overdrafted basin by the state. And let's see if we got this. Um, as you can see here in the red, down in Marina, that this is all seawater intrusion uh, that's occurred. It goes in about eight miles into uh, Salinas. That started in the 40s, in the 50s, it hit Moss Landing, and we detected it at a couple of places here and right at Pleasure Point, and then La Selva Beach, and then if y'all are familiar with the Denmark uh, study that we did, very innovative, they flew off coast and they found out that the seawater intrusion is right at the coastline. So no time to waste. Uh, I point this out because this is a very different problem than what Santa Cruz has. They're, they're almost all uh, surface water, so when it doesn't rain, they're hurting. Uh, our, and they don't really have seawater intrusion except for a small portion up there. It's uh, so, uh, SoCal Point or Pleasure Point. So that's the problem. Now, it's easy to look at a map like this and go, okay, I get it, I see it. And this has happened all around the world. Most populated regions of the world that rely on groundwater have seawater intrusion. You give me a place and I can tell you. So let's put a, let's put a little face to this. So about a month ago, a month and a half ago, this gentleman right here, Mr. Cartwright, walked into our office and well, called uh, Taj DeFore, one of my colleagues, and said, I've got a problem, I need to talk to you. And he said, what is it? He goes, my, my well's been hit. So Mr. Cartwright has a place down in La Selva Beach, and he supplied water by us, but he has a well that um, provides water to about 10 acres of land that he leases out for farming. And it's a 60-year-old well, and about a year and a half, two years ago, it started getting seawater intrusion. He had to refund the farmer who leases his land, I think it was about $25,000, uh, give it back to him because it, it's seawater intruded, it got hit. And uh, these are two quotes by Mr. Cartwright. It's a small problem for each farmer, but a large problem for the county. Ultimately, it will impact the availability of safe drinking water. And just to drive the point home, here was his farm no longer farmed, and there in the background looking inland is probably the next to get. So what's, what's the solution from the district's perspective in our community? Well, we met, um, we developed what uh, we call the community water plan. And it consists of really these icons right here. Conservation, is there a laser on this? Yeah, there is. We know about middle button. Does that work, John? Yeah. <laughs> the, um, this is conservation. We're all doing a fantastic job. Everybody should get up and take a bow in this room. We're using about 50, 55 gallons per day per person. That's maybe almost a third of what the state average is. Way to go. Groundwater well management. 
Easy to underestimate the power of this. Taj DeFore has actually headed up this our effort. We've been moving wells inland and seeing a dramatic uh, response to higher water levels at the coast. I have a graph that shows move wells inland, pump less, water levels at the coast grow up, go up. It's, uh, very, uh, very good technique, but we, we can't really do much more with that. So then these two won't solve the problem, so we have this host of uh, supply options that I'm going to roll into, and that's really going to be the focus of the presentation. I want to say here one thing, though. I think this is important to give you a little insight to SoCal Creek Water District's mindset. Uh, everybody seems to develop a favorite. I had a letter on my desk last week from a man that said he just bashed all these options and says, decel is the only way to go. And it reminds me of that cartoon from the New York Times that when we were in the drought and it had a picture of California. Oh, poor California in a drought. And it had a big arrow to the Pacific Ocean. It was saying, hello, like this, you know. So there's parts of the country that think these sell are the option. Other people, um, there's some people here tonight who are really big on river water exchanges. Uh, I know Jerry's come and presented to our uh, agency about that. Uh, the people who, who are big on water reuse, they say, let's stop taking and start reusing, you know, recycling. Uh, and I think everybody has a sweet spot. This is our icon for stormwater recharge right here. Um, that's, a, that's a noble cause, but it won't solve our problem that we need to do. So we've developed some mantras out of this. One is fall in love with sustainability, not a project. And I mean that because when you work hard on something or if you get, start getting focused, you tend to just get narrowed and that can cause biases that aren't best for our community. The other one is have a mission, not an agenda. And a couple of other things that have popped out recently are, this isn't an optimization uh, situation, which is engineers, which is the bulk of our industry. We tend to just try to nail it to the point. This is more of a risk mitigation because there's a lot of unknowns here. So to think we're going to nail this just perfectly, it's probably not good thinking. So a little bit of insurance as we go along the way might be a, um, a healthy thing. You know, maybe redundant supplies like Mother Nature gave us two eyes, two lungs to protect us. A little redundancy here. So, our community water plan. As Rosemary showed with the WASAC, very good effort there. We did something parallel. Process matters. We took about a year and I think 14 months or a year and a half to explore the options, evaluate and select. We had numerous meetings with our public. Every board meeting, or once a month at each board meeting, we opened it up to the public and discuss this item throughout that entire period. Uh, I know some of y'all presented that are in the crowd tonight. But what came out of this, what our community said was, and this timeliness, that was the number one thing. They said, dadgummit, just do something. And I think if you looked at John's presentation, how long we've been going through this, you could see a sense of uh, frustration on our uh, public, our, our customers' faces. Water quality, everybody wants uh, good water quality. We're not going to sacrifice that. Our board's always gone beyond the call of duty and cleaning up things. We have naturally occurring arsenic and chromium-6, and they've always done that. And reliability, they said, is paramount. We cannot afford to have seawater intrusion or game over there. You notice cost is not on here. It's important, but it didn't rank in the top three. So, new water supplies. So, I'm going to go through each of these, as you saw on the icon, real quickly. River water transfers, desalinization, from water capture, and water purification, where we are at that. And again, it may not be one of these, it may be a combination that gets our community to where we need to be. So, river water transfers. I'm a very physical guy, I have to see it. Uh, so. My wife and I went up and looked at the uh, creeks where we have a uh, contract or an MOU with the city of Santa Cruz to do this water exchange. We call it the short term, but it's the smaller water exchange for about 300 acre feet a year. Here are the, um, here are the creeks. Here's Laguna Creek, Lydell Creek, beautiful thing if, if you've been there. I, I just first time I've done that. And then Majors Creek. So a couple years ago, we sat down and we came up with uh, an agreement. Uh, we split the cost on the CEQA analysis, and we have that uh, rolling. Um, and, you know, it's some people, I just want to show how serious we are about the water transfer. So we have what we call guiding principles. And to me, they're more important than really anything we have, more important than our strategic plan. Because really, when I have a question, I go back to this. And this is in our, gui our guiding principles. 
you know, the district is evaluating river transfers for two different options, North Coast, the San Lorenzo, continue to work with the city on the North Coast, and continue to look, work with them on the um, uh, San Lorenzo River. So we're, we're, we're serious about this. If that's not enough, the cooperative agreement that we have in place with the city of Santa Cruz says, hey, this, this is really about a pilot to see if there's any beginnings of a longer term process. So not just the 300 acre feet, there's more to be had there uh, in developing a longer term agreement. So what have we done on that? Well, last week Taj uh, gave a presentation, which you'll hear in August to your commission. And We've worked with top-notch people. Mark Edwards, a guy who from Virginia Tech did the um, Flint, Michigan. Flint, Michigan. Thank you, uh, and many other, uh, a couple other places anyway, assisted Black and Beach on the uh, analysis. So we developed uh, a, these are a couple of the studies. Did a desktop analysis, a CEQA analysis. Did some bench scale testing, jar testing. Which go back and look at our last. Uh, agenda and that item, you'll see all these cool pictures of how, how it worked out. And then um, we're hoping to do the full school, full scale pilot uh, test come this winter, as, as Rosemary said. The bench scale su seems to suggest that, hey, the waters are fairly compatible. You don't want to adjust this too much or this way or that way. So we'll take it to the uh, pilot, uh, full school scale pilot test, uh, hopefully in, in December or November if there's enough water. And, we get meet some of the conditions that the regulators are asking us for. So, river water transfers. Now let's transfer to deep water desalinization. Really, it should just be desalinization. But what, what's going on down in Moss Landing? There's a, a private agency uh, looking to uh, do a large desalinization plant right, right at the heart, right at Moss Landing. There, you know where the canyon goes out, and. One of our other mantras is keep as many options on the table as long as possible because you never know how it's all going to turn out, right? That as long as it makes sense. So we're keeping all these options open, even deep, deep water desal option. We signed a, a memorandum of interest with them in 2015, our board did, uh, for 1,500 acre feet. That's what we think we need to uh, stop the overdraft and keep seawater at bay. It's a non-binding obligation, just says we're interested. We did contribute, I think, $10,000 to the EIR to include the pipelines, 15 mile long pipeline from Moss Landing to us, to, and we purchased that water. I say this is, it's definitely literally, and maybe figuratively, a long shot, but again, we don't want to take anything off the table. So stormwater capture, we've been working with uh, UCSC, RCD, the county's been very involved with this. Our board asked us to go back and look at our whole area. Where could we recharge water and how much could we get? So um, we, this is just a little sample map. This background map is something that UCSC Andy Fisher developed. And from that, we, developed, we looked at areas, and there were about 30 of them, and we scaled it down. This is just an example where, hey, it's possible we might get good, good infiltration. Then again, we relied on the Denmark folks. They, they have this little nifty device you can pull behind you that looks down into the ground and tells you, is it a good place to actually recharge water? Net result of this, we found two or three sites um, that may recharge 30 or 40 acre feet. So again, it's not going to solve the problem, but there's multiple benefits to stormwater recharge. Uh, so we're still looking at that option too. So now I'm going to transition to uh, recycle water. And what I'm really talking about tonight is recycle water in the form that it gets purified. And not that you can drink it directly, this, uh, although the state's working on that, those regulations now. And obviously, you see they allow it to some degree. But um, where you take it, you put it down back in the ground, and then you pull it out. And that's called potable reuse. So I'm going to use that term, potable reuse. So taking what happens, well, I'll show you the process here. We'll walk through it. There are regulations developed. The state board has regulations to, to do this, uh, and so does the World Health Organization. Texas actually already has regulations for direct potable in a couple places down there have been doing it, and, and our state is working on that now. But our project is not for direct potable. It's only to take the water, purify it, put it in the ground, let it sit for a while, let some of it create a barrier, and, and then pull some of it out. Is that clear? Okay. So potable uh, water reuse has been happening. It's been happening in Orange County since, uh, I don't know, about 40 or 50 years. That's who 
did these bottles of water and gave them to us. Uh, and then there's all these other places around the state that it's getting ready to go. I, I read a statistic a couple months ago, 75% of the water agencies are looking to do this now. Uh, Silicon Valley's doing it. They've got a rather big plant. Um, Monterey uh, is, is doing it too. They just started construction on their plant, very similar to ours. They take ag uh, runoff also. So I, I'm doing this because I feel like uh, I'm trying to correct some or put out some information where we hear the biggest uh, concerns regarding recycled water because what we found, and this is a study we did and it's replicated everywhere, is about 55% of the people are generally for recycled potable water like this. But what happens is when you give them some just a few facts, that number jumps up to the high 70s. So I think we got 75% acceptance once we educate it. So we feel that's very important, otherwise we feel we put our customers at a disadvantage in making probably the best, you know, their, what we, you know, the best decision they could with, if we don't give them the, all the information. So, Pure Water SoCal, what it is planned on doing is taking 25% uh, of the 8 million gallons a day of treated wastewater that goes out to the Monterey Bay. It's collected down here near the lagoon and they treat it and push out 8 million gallons a day on average to the uh, sanctuary. So what we want to do is um, take uh, some of that uh, treated secondary water, that would be our source right here from the outfall basically, um, purify it, and I'm going to go through and talk about what that really is just so you're sure to understand it, and then uh, take it in a pipe, put it in a well, let it sit, and it infiltrates down and recharges the aquifers below. And this is exactly what um, some of the other agencies in, in Orange County does. So let's, let's examine this a little bit more. So what is that middle part, that mysterious middle part of advanced treatment? Well, I'm going to show you. So right here is, is what City of Santa Cruz and the county do down in Erie Lagoon. They do primary and secondary treatment. And you know, it's pretty good water. You get a bottle of it, it's clear. It doesn't even smell at that stage. Actually, the testing we did, this met all the MCLs. I don't know if that's good or scary, but it did. It met all the MCLs, not the pathogens, the MCLs. So the water's in decent shape, but um, not good enough to drink. What we want to do, and this, we all, by the way, this is the heavy lift. This is a big lift in cleaning up the water. We all pay, if you own a house, uh, you pay $750 a year, at least if you live in the county, for this portion alone right here. So the big lift's already done. So we want to take that and put it through all these fancy things, MF, UF, this is just microfiltration, reverse osmosis, and advanced oxidation, uh, UV light basically. What this is, is a filter, one three hundredth the size of your hair, it goes through there, it takes out some of the uh, viruses, bacteria, a few things like that, uh, gets rid of them, uh, physical removal, and then you come up to RO, this is the, this is Oh man, this stuff is good. It, it basically removes everything. Everything except that's really low molecular weight. Like there's a, a, a byproduct that people often talk about. Uh, MS, what, MDMA. MDMA, people are worried about, has a low molecular weight, I think of like 70 atomic mass units or something. My son just had a study for a chemistry test for college entrance, so I've been going enough. Anyway, um, that does get through. However, uh, this takes care of that. It destroys it. So this process is uh, robust, very robust. And there's years and years, 50 years of data showing this. I don't want to pull out a bunch of data because you're tired, you're kind of going, uh. But I, what I will show you is what kind of changed me. And you know, our whole board was like, OK, if we're going to look at this, we've got to make sure we we're, feel comfortable with this. You know? Our customers are expressing you know, curiosity. Uh, so we did a couple things, um, and before I jump to that, here's what the facility would basically look like. This is San Diego's pure water facility that they actually just certified the EIR unanimously through the council down there. But this, their demo plant is about the size of our plant. This is uh, 1 million gallons per day, ours would be 1.3. So here are the RO units. Here are the microfiltration units, and on the other side is the UV, so it'd be about a little bit longer, and, you know, it extends out about half the width of here. 
Santa Cruz, this combination of people that went on that tour. So there it is. That's basically it if you want to see what that facility would look like constructed. And they, they made it open so people could see it. So going back to water quality, um, knowing it's a concern, our board hired an um, independent panel. And we, we did. We had to hire them. It was our, we paid them. So, you know, full disclaimer there. But this is Karen Nelson from UC Berkeley. Uh, uh, I won't go through the names, but it's a who's who kind of uh, in this area if you've worked in risk and that kind of thing, which was my previous job. I was so excited to meet some of these people. And they came together. They provided oversight. The bottom line is here's their conclusion. The panel concludes that the project is plausible, plausible feasible, and protective of human health. And use of this uh, advanced treatment uh, technologies that I just showed you is uh, proven. It's, uh, and it meets all requirements and protective health. Um, they did say, hey, it's rather on the small side, but you got to do what you got to do. This was a headline in the, uh, the Sentinel there. So they hired that, and they've been oversighting and, and saying, hey, you need to do X, Y, and Z, and we've been, trying, we've been following what they said. Now, that was great, and I believed it. And then what kind of what got me going was this woman from Berkeley on the left, Dr. Nelson, in her presentation here, she talked about de facto water use. And that means, she goes, well, we've been doing this all, Europe's been doing it forever, we've been doing it for, forever in the United States. And what she meant was, all the towns back east and even some around here have uh, been taking water out of a river, using it, and dumping their influent back in the river, treated to secondary standards. Then the next town comes out, uses conventional uh, surface water treatment, treats it, uses it and dumps it back in the, uh, in the river, right? And so here's, a, here's an example. I just want to give you one example. This is northern Atlanta. This is the Chattahoochee River. I love that name. It means painted rock. And here is a discharge of 25 million gallons a day of secondary affluent into the Chattahoochee. Here they are pulling out 65 million gallons, and then down below they're dumping in another uh, 80 million gallons a day. Now, what I don't show is up to here to Lake Lenore. I used to live back in this area. You may detect an accent. Uh, about a 30-mile drive, there's probably 10 of these places dumping in. Um, I have a map of uh, secondary affluent. So mind you, they're, they're, this river is largely composed of secondary affluent with regular river water. They pull it out and treat it to conventional treatment. That's, that's OK. But then I thought, we thought, well, we're kind of doing the same thing, except we don't have that 3 to 1 or 4 to 1 or 10 to 1 dilution of the river, right? Because we're taking just secondary affluent. But we're treating it more than you would treat uh, surface water, regular surface water treatment. So I wish I had another bottle. That's what this bottle was for. So how many times more stringent is potable use, reuse treatment over surface water treatment for pathogen removal? So we're basically treating similar waters, but how much more is it required by the regulators to treat uh, the secondary that comes straight out of uh, you know, the sewage plant there than versus when it comes out of a river? Anybody want to guess? 10 times, 100 times? Come on, John. 500. 500, good, good, good. Way off, way off, by the way. Good. Anybody else? Come on, give me a number. I mean, just have fun with it. A million. Who would be so foolish? A hundred million. A hundred million times more stringent for the treatment of pathogens. So when I saw this, when we, when we realized this, that was a game changer for me. And I, I tell you that because everybody's worried about water quality because we haven't seen this much, we haven't seen this done, and change is hard for us. So anyway, we'll move on. The other big thing people are uh, concerned about, and rightfully so, I'm not here to diminish anything, I'm here to show the science uh, to help aid, is uh, if you put this down in the ground, if you do recharge the aquifers, uh, and if something did happen, oh, there's multiple barriers, multiple testing, and, and I've just gone through the water quality, could it uh, impact all the, everybody's aquifer throughout the county? Could it, could it contaminate us? And the answer is no. Here is the groundwater model results. These are in our draft EIR, which I'm going to get to in a minute. 
This is one example. This is twin, uh, over at Twin Lakes uh, in Cabrillo College where the model simulation where we put the water down that's expected to, to be uh, recharging the well. And this is the particle tracking. The way this model works is the groundwater, they model the groundwater flowing out through a particle tracking method. It's been used for years. And this right here is, the, eight, the red is the eight year mark. This is the 25 year mark, how the water's moving out. The reason it kind of, in gradient, the water naturally flows from up here down to here. So you would expect all the water to go like this, except we have some wells here and here that kind of pull it back a little bit, our big wells do. So that's why you see that. So um, relatively contained and doing exactly what we want it to do. Right here is one of the hot spots determined by the uh, hydrologist, over 50%. Uh, higher than 50% opportunity for uh, seawater intrusion. Uh, and we already have it uh, nearby, so uh, we picked a good spot. So, a couple closing slides. Pure water, Soquel. Um, cost estimate is $90 million. There's a range there. And I'll say the 90 million, because we want to try to be as genuine as we can, that's at midpoint construction, so we've inflated the dollars there. We're not doing today's dollars. Uh, and that helps with grant matches. Um, so we've been very fortunate thus far in developing our relationships with grants. We, uh, all of the Scotts Valley, I saw Perret here, uh, Santa Cruz and us came together. We all got this uh, $75,000 feasibility study grant. Very appreciative of that. Thank you all. And then the uh, Bureau of Reclamation saw what we were doing and we talked to them. And they said, oh, that's an interesting project. This is all state, right? This is feds. And um, even though we don't get Bureau of Water, they control half the water in the West, they said it's interesting enough project, we'll give you $150,000 to take that feasibility study and make it up to par for us so you can apply for more grant money. And so then, um, during that time, recently the state has awarded us $2 million to do a Prop 1 planning grant. But here's where it gets interesting. Here's where it gets fun. Um, the potential grants out there. Both these entities actually changed their criteria, partly due to us banging on their door, going to you know, their board meetings and stuff, and other agencies too, but especially the state board, to accommodate uh, our type of project. They, it, 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 it let us in the door, and when they give you the planning grant, they really want to give you the construction uh, money because they've got an investment. So we're uh, in the midst of applying for this grant right now, and the Bureau of Rec, uh, we were a couple, uh, Tom LeHue, Bruce Daniels, we went to um, Denver, I don't know, about a month and a half ago, met with their people there, met with some people in D.C. They're putting our project on the name, on a letter, to go to Congress, which makes us eligible for this uh, money right here. So that's a good step. Uh, I don't think we'll get it all, but I think we'll get, I, I have high hopes. I feel good about getting a good chunk. We're certainly going to try it. It, it. It's the best thing we can do for our customers. So with that, most optimistic, uh, 90 minus 70, which is this, is, is, a, is a $20 million project. In, in reality, I bet we get a large, I hope we get a large chunk of this, and this may come out in one or $2 million increments if, if we're fortunate. That's usually the way it works. So what's the time frame, Pure Water Soquel? Well, we've, we're, we're in the midst of, a, 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 the, the EIR is out, and actually I have uh, packets for each of the committee members, advisory committee and the boards, uh, with the community, what do we call it, the community guide uh, of the EIR because the thing's pretty thick and we have some copies for the public and it's online if you want it. Um, we'll give that out right after this. And then, but, so that's out, it's comment time on that. Please submit your comments, we really do appreciate it. It helped the first time we went out, we got some great comments and we re the board revised a lot of stuff and we went back out. So the final EIR should be out in the end of the year, roughly. And if, if the EIR is certified, it, we would move forward with uh, design and construction with the goal of replenishing the basin in that time frame, maybe having uh, some water to, to provide back to uh, Santa Cruz, too. Thank you. Thank you, Ron. Uh -huh. so, Next on the list here is the process and relation to the groundwater sustainability plan okay. program.
was so mesmerized, I forgot I was supposed to do this. <laughs> okay, so this, these two graphics, I just want to take a minute uh, on. They're in your packet. I picked the mic up. Oh, I did. Thank you. There you go. All right. These two graphics are in your packet. I don't actually think I can use this because these aren't connected. Um, so the point of this was really to show the relationship of projects to the ultimate product that we have to create here, which is use technology, right? Okay, so the basic project we have to create is we have to have a management plan that includes um, projects and a financing plan, the program implementation, so what are we, how are we going to meet the sustainability criteria, what are they, what do we want them to be, and then what is the projects and management actions that will get us there, and um, what is the plan implementation, including financing. Now, this document does not say that MGA has to do the projects. It does not have to say that. It just has to say how the projects are going to get done, which is sort of gets to Dr. Daniel's questions about, well, who's going to do them and how do we want to think about that? And that's certainly a conversation that we will definitely need to have before we can finalize this, this plan. But nevertheless, the projects are an element. This is, the, this is the requirement of the project section right here, section four, which has to describe um, for each project how the measurable objectives that are set will be uh, expected to benefit from the project or action, uh, expected benefits, how they will be evaluated, how they'll be accomplished, what are the estimated costs and management actions and plans to meet those costs. So the ba this, this basic graphic shows that all of the stuff from section two, which is the basin setting, feeds into the conversation that, the, for example, the advisory committee has been having about minimum thresholds, measurable objectives, undesirable results. Those will come out, this will produce some goals that we'll use, you know, feed the model with, and then in order to solve the problem, you have to have some kind of set of projects that go back into it. And there's an opportunity for iterating this to sort of fine tune the balance between what projects you're doing and how they will achieve these objectives. Uh, until this is all finished, for example, one of the things that, I'm gonna ask you to move to the next um, graphic, please, Tim. Um, and the, the process funnel graph, which you'll also see here, um, which was done by uh, Georgina King, a very, um, Teasing us once a step. Shows the iterative process. So basically, in the first phase of the work that the committee's been doing since the first of the year, they've been working to understand the basin conditions, terminology, and what their role is. They've done an initial design. They haven't really talked too much about projects and management actions until now, but they've been working on preliminary minimum thresholds, impact assessment, this will be modeling, it'll produce a result, they'll have a chance to see how did the, some of the um, preliminary minimum thresholds that they chose uh, affect the, the results here and you know, do they want to make them more stringent, less stringent. So there's a refinement process here involving the same kinds of activities of looking at the management actions and minimum um, uh, and projects. Uh, more modeling, obviously um, refining the projects and management actions and the minimum thresholds, and then to the final design. This will be the process that will occur kind of after, the, in the beginning, the first half of 2019, but between now and the end of this year, we're going to be in this process, so, and, and finalizing the end of this process. So projects are a key element of the planning process. Again, I want to clarify, it doesn't require this agency to say we're going to own and operate these projects, and that's a big question that the um, MGA board in particular may want to have conversations about in consultation with the advisory committee or not, but um, it's, it's really a process where we can't achieve what we need to achieve and in, a, in putting a plan together that will meet the state's requirements without talking about projects in some detail, because you can see from the other graphic, there's quite a bit of requirements for us to describe how those projects would affect the basin. That's why we're talking about them now. 
and that's why we'll be talking about them more as in the weeks to come. Okay. Okay, thank you, Rosemary. And now we're going to have some time for, um, I think, how many community members wanted to present their plan? Mr. Jerry Paul and those two. Okay. So um, if you could. You can choose who wants to go first, but you now have that time. So maybe five minutes each. Um, eight minutes. Okay. So eight minutes. Okay. So fifteen minutes is fine. We'll give you guys fifteen minutes. I'm trying to let you know. Yeah. Yeah. Um, anyway, we are the uh, Water for Santa Cruz County group, and we wanted to study um, the feasibility of transferring river water so that we can start replenishing the aquifer right away. Um, the, um, <clears throat> excuse me, the transfers would help to achieve the regional water security, of course. Um, it's just one of the many answers to the problem. Uh, if anybody has any questions at all about anything that I'm talking about or what's on the, the graphs or anything, we ask that you do call, I mean, uh, email us at that address and somebody will answer you within two days. It just depends on what the questions are, who has the expertise in that area, and so on. Uh, next one. Um, the purpose of this presentation, of course, is to make our statement. And uh, the WSAC recommended that water transfers were the top solution, simply because of availability, cost, and safety. The water chemistry study of Santa Cruz surface and Soquel Creek Water District groundwater uh, indicates that the cape, that the waters are compatible, um, so we won't have any problems per se. There might be slight adjustments and stuff, but nothing radical. Um, the water transfers are a go as far as we know now, um, because Santa Cruz and everyone has been working uh, with Soquel Creek Water to work on the transfers. Next one. Next slide. Oh, there we go, sorry. Um, these were the three questions that we really were concerned about. We had dozens of them, but we really narrowed it down to three major ones. Um, one was how much water does the North, North Coast have to ship? Well, um, you'll see on the next slide, we, we have the answers, but there's um, plenty of water to ship now and um, it, it will um, really get the ball rolling as far as uh, replenishing the water in the aquifer. Uh, how much can Santa Cruz replace water sent to the Soquel Creek uh, customers? And then is there um, infrastructure present and significant enough to treat and transfer the water? Uh, next slide. So as you see here, there's 671 million gallons per year available. Uh, the transferred uh, water represents no risk to Santa Cruz per se. It, I mean, as far as we could figure, it looks safe and everything because Santa Cruz has water rights to 900 million gallons out of the San Lorenzo River. Um, and it typically does not use it. Um, of course, with droughts and things like that, figures vary, but you'll see a little bit later in, in this presentation uh, that even during a critically dry year, uh, we can still transfer water. Uh, the infrastructure is already in place to treat the transfer and to treat and transfer 1.4 million gallons a day, uh, which is of course 500 million gallons a year. Um, and more can be transferred at a later date just by enlarging the size of the pipes. Um, next one. Here, this is just a lot of information. It'll give you about Santa Cruz, uh, where they get their water, what they, you know, what's available to them, 
and then what's um, uh, total, what was it, the Soak Hill Creek right here. Um, and the totals down here will give you everything out of that part. Then um, these up here are just additional information about where water can come from and that sort of thing. As you read it, it makes a lot of sense, but, and it, we simplified it as much as we could. Okay, next one. Um, Santa Cruz has abundant water in wet and normal years. What about the dry years? Next one. Um, a 2018 uh, is a critically dry year, and uh, it was a, declared a drought emergency. Yet even in this year, the San Lorenzo River uh, produced 669 million gallons in two months. So the water could have been harvested, transferred, but instead it just went out to the ocean. So these are just, you know, things that we want to make sure that everybody understands is that we're not taking more water from anywhere. It's just a lot of it's just water that's already going out to the ocean. Next. Uh, this graph here shows um, the harvesting in a critically dry year. And uh, it's just uh, shows what Santa Cruz, uh, I mean, excuse me, the fish, Santa Cruz, uh, the brown is the um, Soquel Creek. And so it just shows you how much percentage of the water is used and things. But even in a critically uh, dry year, we found that uh, we won't harm the fish if we take out the amounts that we've been talking about. Of course, if it's a really wet year, we can pump even more water out of the rivers. Okay, next slide. Again, this is just showing the graphs of um, how much water is available. And you'll see it here, if, I, if we got it right, uh, 16, 17, you know, in here, this is where this year was, right here. And uh, we would still be able to harvest water and not harm the fish. And, uh, uh, you know, that's just um, shows, shows you what's there. In here, the uh, classification system just tells you, uh, it shows you in the dry year and um, wet year and normal and everything. So. It's all self-explanatory, but if you have any questions about it, again, give us a call or e email us, and um, we'll be glad to uh, take care of any questions that you have about it. And it does, it, it's, um, it's simplified from, from what we originally had, and um, you should be able to get a lot of information out of just that. Next one. Um, so in conclusion, there is water available. And um, the water has been shown to be compatible between the aquifer and the river water. The infrastructures already exist, and um, uh, the um, Santa Cruz Water uh, Department has publicly indicated its willingness to transfer water, which this was something we had to overcome because there were some misunderstandings and things, but everybody's worked together. We've got a lot done, and uh, we're really happy about all of that. And then given these facts, we, of course, we urge all parties to double their current efforts to make this uh, a go and get this water moving and get that aquifer filled. This is just one step, but it's doable. It's doable now, and hopefully by December this, this year, we'll have water running into the aquifer. Thank you. By the way, who are you? Oh, I'm Gary Lindstrom, yes. <laughs> Thank you. I need hands to it. I need hands to it. You okay? But somebody care to push, uh, well, no, I need this for one. Well, so yeah. what? Yeah. Thank you for this opportunity. I can address the slides if you prefer. But the pointer's on the same thing, so I. I Thanks anyway. I, I think I'm in. Yeah, By the computer, they can advance. They can advance for you. You can still use the point. All right. Um, 
Very good. Thank you. Uh, uh, I'm Jerry Paul, resident of Santa Cruz, and uh, since uh, about 2010, I've been uh, attending meetings of many agencies, perhaps 15 altogether, uh, and uh, harassing people about aquifer uh, uh, alternative for uh, recharging the aquifers very quickly at very low cost. Um, I'm here um, partly to answer your questions. When I have asked many of you in official positions, what is it about L'Aquifer you know, that, that is uh, 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 hard for you, you've given me uh, questions, and uh, I'm trying to answer them, uh, many of them, in this uh, uh, talk. Um, I'm providing 17 pages for the public record. Do you have that? Um, if you don't, um, would you please uh, distribute those for me? So, uh, the board doesn't have these at all? Um, no, the board. I, I thought that was somehow electronically they'd be in your inbox or something. Well, you need um, to promise that you would get them. Uh, yes, I'll, I'll do that. Um, th it's uh, what you see here. What I'm going to do is uh, 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 give the the, the, the principles, the, 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 the key points, and then uh, use the uh, spots in the talk to answer your questions um, that I've gathered over the years. Um, one question is, um, uh, or claim, or issue is uh, uh, somebody, as uh, several of you have said, I'm responsible to my constituency and no others. And um, it sounds very reasonable, and technically, legally, uh, uh, that's literally the case. Um, however, I believe that in this situation, your, 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 your constituency is much better off if you cooperate with, with each other. And incidentally, I'm delighted to see all the cooperation that's been displayed on the screen and in the room in, in these many meetings. So uh, it, it's... It, it's something that I'm delighted with and I'm, I urge you to do more of. Uh, only with a greater sense of urgency. We lose a well, we lose not just the well, we have to replace it, and a means of transportation of the water to the affected area, and uh, it, it, in the, the time it takes to do that, uh, it, it becomes a quintuple whammy because we lose other wells in the process uh, of the time we lost. Uh, uh, next, please. Uh, L'Aquifer, in as little as three years, should be able to make, uh, you know, three years of operation, full operation, should uh, supply, it should make the region drought proof against an eight year drought. Um, and this, this is a condensation of, a, of a, a longer statement by Gary Fiss, the computer consultant for the convergence model. Um, and since then, uh, slightly uh, stiffer criteria have been applied, but the, the numbers haven't changed much. Um, similarly, similarly, L'Aquifer, being huge, should fill all the local aquifers in the middle half of the county within about a decade. So it's, it's the biggest thing that's um, in the forefront right now. Um, it's been said that we have a water shortage problem. It, we, what we really have is a water storage problem. And we have plenty of storage space. Uh, the uh, uh, aquifers collectively are three to six times bigger than La Cloma. Uh Next, please. Um, this is just uh, La uh, pedigree. You know, are we credible? And it started with uh, a dozen uh, professional uh, civil engineers and geology professors and 2010, and uh, we've been uh, as intimate as, as uh, uh, possible with WASAC, and um, you'll see that Portfolio 70 is the, uh, uh, the name of the aquifer in the WASAC uh, materials. The uh, uh, has improved a lot. It doesn't need the, uh, as much water treatment as we thought in WASAC, and a few other things. The, the cost has gone down radically. Next, please. Um, the values in L'Aquifer uh, don't just have to do with water. 
Salient incursion, sustainability, the people's money is one thing that I haven't heard mentioned here a lot. But I believe that L'Aquifer could save this area as much as three or four hundred million dollars by providing so much water for such low cost. Certainly will save energy. And uh, of course, this money uh, makes the prices of local businesses and institutions um, um, higher if you spend more on water. Uh, it also can help the private pumpers by helping the aquifers. Fish habitat, it, the, the lock will uh, be able to be used flexibly for fish in a way that might make fisheries regulators uh, give us water rights more readily and stop the, 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 the tension um, and uh, really help uh, improve the uh, ecosystem. Um, one thing that's been said is, don't worry, our expensive scheme has grant money, and um, uh, grant money is taxpayer money. Uh, L'Aquifer also welcomes grant money, but needs a lot less of it. Uh, next, please. Here's a comparison, uh, a, a general, not to, not to, um, uh, uh, how can I say, uh, not very precise, but very instructive. Aquifers in the yellow stripe. If you look down here, uh, there's not just capital costs, but there's the extra uh, operating and maintenance costs that RO systems in general have co compared to the kind of system uh, Santa Cruz has today, uh, or SoCal has today, or L'Aquifer would be. And then there's finance costs on all this. The sum of those three is shown in this column. Uh, for L'Aquifer, we're thinking 45 million. Uh, this is 30-year operation and maintenance cost, by the way, the excess of it, not just the regular what people are paying for water today. Um, so 45 million for L'Aquifer, about 160 million for uh, recycled wastewater, like a, a pure water SoCal, approximate number. Um, and the, the capacity, million gallons per year, for L'Aquifer is 1350, and that includes not just what is sent, but you also subtract what is sent back uh, to Santa Cruz. So that's the net uh, average. And uh, 475, so we've got three and a half times uh, uh, less cost and, and three times more water, the, 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 the value uh, comparison then between L'Aquifer and Pure Water SoCal is L'Aquifer is 10 times better. Uh, 10 times the bang for the buck. Uh, another thing I'd like to point out here is the rain check for fish. Um, to store water in the lock until May or until when fish need it is one big advantage that we can't do really well right now because we're trying to keep the lock full against drought. Whereas if the, the lock job were given to the aquifers to, to, to protect us against drought, the aquifers are many times bigger, and it frees up the lock to be used for fish in, in, a, in a flexible way. Uh, and uh, uh, also, to, the big job is to scoop the winter river water out of the river, which you can't do if the lock is already full, like it, it tends to be right now. Right now, it's at 96%. If we can, uh, 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 well, uh, let's see, what the, uh, rain check for fish. Um, notice how low these numbers are. Fish don't carry wallets. It's part of the problem with, with the uh, fisheries regulators and the water rights. Uh, they can stop us from getting water rights if we don't uh, do what they think we should do about the fish. And here, we can provide cheap water to fish with L'Aquifer, and flexibly, any time of year. We can also run it through the uh, aquifers around Scotts Valley and have, have uh, cold, clean water uh, targeted very specifically. So, Jerry, Jerry, just want to let you know we've, we've used eight and a half minutes already, and you're on your fifth slide, so. I better. Yeah. Uh, thank you. Uh, next, please. Um, I believe you're going to want L'Aquifer anyway, even if you do something else. And it, because there's such a huge amount of water at a small expense, um, ten times better deal, and, and because fish don't carry wallets, and to stay way ahead of climate change and sea level rise. We're talking one decade instead of two or more. Next, please. 
here's how much water is in various things. The, the flow of the San Lorenzo River uh, is, uh, uh, Santa Cruz only uses 7% of what's in the river. Um, SoCal demand is 40% of Santa Cruz demand. And Santa Cruz demand is about the same as the capacity of the lock. So SoCal uses about 40% of what's in the lock. And the way lock refer would work is that uh, of that 40% that that would go to SoCal, only 30% would come from the lock and 10% would come from the river directly because it would be in winter time in that case. Next, please. Uh, I've just said this part. Uh, besides satisfying all of SoCal's demand most years, uh, we can inject some, uh, you know, once the, the, the wells are shut off in SoCal because they're getting their water from Santa Cruz, we can put water down those wells, use them in reverse, as, as is being, was talked about earlier. So we can actually supply more than the entirety of SoCal's demand. Fire hoses. This is the biggest issue why people are confused about cost. Uh, most water systems are like a string of 10 fire hoses. If you pinch any one, you don't get water out the end that, that you need. Right now, for, for L'Aquifer, four hoses are pinched. The water rights at Felton, diversion device to take more water out at Felton, a, a, a widening of the pipeline from Felton to the lock, and the potable inner tie across 41st Avenue from Santa Cruz to, to uh, SoCal. With those things uh, brought in to, uh, to be a match set with, with the others, we'll have 10 fire hoses that are matched, and the, the, the cost for that is a, a, about 35 million altogether. Um, uh, very cheap. In fact, if SoCal offered to pay it, just the 35 million, Santa Cruz would get a water system for free, and SoCal could use its grants to reimburse itself for 35 million. <laughs> Um, it, we could basically have a water system for free in the entire region. Um, next, please. Uh, in Scotts Valley, we have a, a, another uh, treatment. It's called dry time surface spreading. It uh, lets water go down in the aquifers, and what escapes feeds the fish. Next, please. So we're going to install a well, widen two pipelines, jointly apply for water rights. Um, and I'm happy to see that that's been started. That's, that's a really key thing. Next, please. Uh, you've seen this before, but I wanted to point out the fish sandwich here. Fish, Santa Cruz, Soquel, the lock, and fish. The part that goes to the lock needs to be 30 MGD. That's what this yellow stripe is. And uh, with that, uh, if you take that and add it up, it's 1,200 million gallons. It's more than SoCal's annual demand. And this is from 2018, which is a critically dry year, this year. So even in a critically dry year, if we get the water rights to do this, like, you know, give the fish the water, the, 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 their, their share first, then Santa Cruz, then SoCal, then the lock, in that quantity, and if the pipe is big enough to the lock, we can really make hay. And, and it's not that risky anymore. Next, please. Here's a histogram that you also saw before. 2018 is about right here. Uh, on this graph, on the blue, that's the important part. Notice that the SoCal's entire demand here, and then some, is being satisfied in the wet years and the normal years. And then as a matter of degree, as the years get drier and drier, the amount that Santa Cruz has left over to send to SoCal descends. Then there's a period here with the asterisk where Santa Cruz won't send any to SoCal, but SoCal won't send any to Santa Cruz. Santa Cruz will be getting water from uh, Scotts Valley and from the Belts Wells and, uh, and other little things. And so it's only in this little area here that SoCal sends water back to Santa Cruz. So it's about a, a six to one ratio. So we're four steps ahead of Chairman Mao. We're, we're, we're taking six steps forward and one step back, and uh, that is uh, workable. Thank you. Uh, next one, please. Um, here is the math on how we get to the numbers. Next one, please. Uh, bottom line is 450, uh, 4,050 acre feet or 1,350 mg, a million gallons per year. 
And that weighted average, in other words, after that, that, that includes the water being returned to Santa Cruz. So um, that's 2.7 times more water than pure water SoCal. So this thing hauls off and just really loads up the aquifer fast. Uh, next, please. Uh, this is uh, sort of a repeat. Uh, next, please. Um, so what, what happens is a lot of times in, the, in, in looking at the 10 fire hoses, uh, people are talking about a different set of fire hoses. Um, they'll either leave one off or, or, or add something superfluous, and so we get these different answers. And, and I'd like to invite you to, to uh, try to stay close to the lock or first back when you're, when you're quoting these things. You know, one time uh, there was a quote for, uh, that added $200 million to Lockwerfer because of raising the, the, the locks dam, and, and uh, it's not needed. Or ASR, injection, don't need to do it in Lockwerfer. Charging more than the necessary boost in supply. There was a, um, a, a, a Grand Mill treatment plant uh, improvements which pertain to all the water of Santa Cruz, not just the incremental uh, water that would be sent to SoCal, and things like that. So we need to match them up. These are the numbers, how many MGD for each thing. So th this is what to check against. Next. Uh, please act. Please write the $100 million letter. You'll save $100 million. Get the ball rolling right away. And, and please talk to uh, people who are decision makers. Uh, this is a, a real deal, and we need to act urgently. We're almost ready to go. Thank you so much for letting me um, speak here. Uh, any, any questions? For all of your work. You're welcome. Ron, when would the pure water uh, actually come online to deliver in, in, the, in the projection you have there? When would it actually be starting to do its full capacity? I may need a call for a lifeline to my colleagues. I'm going to say 2023 is what uh, we're aiming for. So didn't, I couldn't see that on the slide. Yeah. yeah. Okay. 2023. Any other discussion items, questions? Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Uh, Rosemary, um, the the withdrawal from ASR would be in drought periods only, or would it be regular? No. Well, it kind of depends a little bit on the characteristics of the aquifer that we would discover when we did pilot testing. But in general, the idea would be to store quantities of water and in wet years or normal wet years and then use that water in dry years. It's one of the one of the questions that has to be asked is how much water that you put down and then how long does it have to what will you be able to get that whole volume or what's the volume you can get back over a longer, longer period of time. Right. right. Yeah. So so it was the idea that uh, the the injection would take place in wet years. The wet uh, months. Yes. Nor, nor, well, the analysis that Gary did took all the water that was available above fish flows and meeting Santa Cruz demands and within water rights constraints and took every drop of water day in, day out, 365 days a year and said this water can go into storage or be used for in -loop. That's how it was done. That's probably not a practical application for a lot of different reasons, so there would be, you know, but it was a sort of sizing thing. But the idea would be that um, you would you would end up mostly taking it in the wet months when it's available above the, um, above fish flows and within the water rights constraint. And, and and not necessarily pulling it back out until it was needed. Right. Which would be when 
when it was dry and it was also a lower than normal supply time for the city. Yeah, or I mean, it's really, for us, the issue is just like this winter, even though it was, uh, you know, we had a really dry December and a pretty dry February, we didn't really have much in the way of precip until about March and April. We're at about half of normal precip in Santa Cruz for this water year, which starts 1st of October. So we get into a trouble situation fairly quickly, even though the reservoir was re reasonably full. For us, the issue isn't what's happening this year. It's, it's going to rain next year. And if we didn't do something to give a little bit of a highlight to folks about uh, you know, being aware, and we hadn't had that March and April rain, we probably would have been in a more significant uh, stage of curtailment. Not because we didn't have enough water to get us through this year, but it doesn't rain the second year in a row or the third year in a row. That's really big trouble for us. And I don't know if you've seen the recent from the state hydrologist uh, looking at what he calls weather whiplash. So it's like multiple years of drought followed by maybe a reasonable year and then really wet, which is kind of what we've had. And they're they're projecting that. Um, the climate may be changing to these more extreme events, right. which makes us even more vulnerable, right? I mean, it's sort of like too much water in 17, more than, you know, way too much, but way not enough in, in 14, water year 14 and water year 15. So, so the one thing I'm just trying to understand with the city's ASR idea is, is, is it that there would be additional water that would be put into the mid-county aquifer more so than was pulled back to the city except in extreme periods of time. Well, so this is one of the big issues that we're looking for modeling to help us to really understand right. because for us, if the threat to the mid-county aquifer of seawater intrusion is such that we could put in 10 gallons but we could only expect to get back one because we need to maintain the you know, the seawater barrier basically, and uh, or it might be one in the first five years, it might be, you know, three in the second five years as the basin begins to recover. Mm -hmm. But in the near term, if we can't get back that 80% of what we're putting in, which may not be a reasonable assumption to make in the mid-county basin, then, then it doesn't mean we wouldn't do it but it does mean that we would have to look elsewhere for something else that would help us meet our needs while the basin was recovering so that we could get back. It might be a good long-term investment, but it might be a terrible short-term investment. It's, uh, this is clearly a very complex issue, and I think uh, the water model indeed is, is going to be the key to solve this. And by the way, there's going to be a TAC meeting in about two weeks to review some of the model. Um, but I think it's worthwhile to look at what Scotts Valley has done. They've had a model for quite a bit of time, and they've looked at some of these kind of issues. And they were talking about what happens if we have a recycled plant and it puts 600 acre feet of water into our basin every year, and indeed it started off going up and up and up and then started slowing down, and after about 30 years it flattened off. So they put 600 acre feet in every year, but the basin doesn't go up anymore. That's because what you've done is by raising groundwater levels, it means the flow to the streams has increased. And if you turned it off and did put the 600 acre feet in, it would start going back down again. They also did a study that said, okay, what happens if a drought happens and we need to actually take some of that water and use it? And within three years, they had gone down below where it started from. So after 30 years of getting up there, they, they had, took water out and it, it, in three years it was below, below zero. And, uh, so those are tricky things, and, and as I said, one of the issues about sharing the basin is, in a bad year, we might not get much of any river water sent to the district's uh, basin or the county the agency basin. We might not get much recharge from, from precipitation, and the district would need to take water out for its customers, and the city would need to take its 1.2 billion gallons out for their customers. So. The basin would get hit really hard. Yeah. And what that would do to things, we really need to understand before yeah. we go any further. Yeah, yes. yeah. And we're assuming that the mid county basin is similar to what happened in Scotts Valley, and that you put this amount in, it's going to go somewhere to the ocean or to the streams. Mm -hmm.
wanted to give an opportunity for the groundwater sustainability advisory committee members to ask questions. Do they have any? I guess I have one just yeah. general question that just came up when everybody was talking, and that relates to damage control um, with any of the options or facilities or, you know, if there's a disaster or an earthquake or there's infrastructure, you know, if we're, if we're putting all eggs in one basket or several baskets, um, um, how are any of these plans uh, responding to terrorism, contamination, you know, arson, earthquake, um, all those sorts of things. It's, that's something that's being discussed in the planning and design of these different options. My, uh, my first thought, and maybe Ron, you know, I just, that's what's so important about having a diversity of, diversified portfolio. If you don't have all your agents on that, you have multiple different potential sources. Yeah, and, and Melanie just wrote a great article on this. It's looking to Mother Nature for, for how to design a resilient system because obviously species have been evolving in that. And so one is uh, uh, duplication. You know, there goes the two eyes, two, you know, two lungs kind of thing. Compartmentalization. So, you know, different things, different places, so different water supplies. So we've looked at those and that, that type of, you know, what it, what it suggests and trying to mimic some of those in our in our solutions to what Mother Nature has to offer. If you read the last uh, editorial in our article in Aptos Times, you'll you'll see some of the principles laid out. So, so the one thing I could add is that the the because of the way the Water Supply Advisory Committee recommendations came together, they didn't recommend a specific project, right? They they recommended a process going forward for creating more comparable information around, around a range of projects. And they created a decision process that includes criteria, cost, timeliness, a sort of a, a, a how many uh, yield that you can get, and a series of additional criteria, including sort of robustness, which means you know ability to adapt. What's one thing they call adaptive flexibility, which is well, we don't really know what's going to happen with climate change, but we probably need to make sure that whatever we do has some adaptability built into it so that we can take what comes. Uh, and as we've been doing system design and, and preparation for a really major capital reinvestment in the Santa Cruz water system, we are definitely looking at those questions for the water system infrastructure as well as the supplies. So those are definitely on the minds of, um, you know, the folks in our organization who are working on these, these things. You, and you can't, you know, I've been about four and a half years and I've had one of the driest years in history and one of the wettest, and those were two years apart, plus, uh, you know, a couple of us sort of somewhat more normal. But there's been a lot of variability and the conditions at the low end of the spectrum in terms of reliability of supply and infrastructure and the high end in that wet year of 17 winter in terms of the reliability of the infrastructure and the sources of supply have been a really big lesson about what kind of variability we might need to be really dealing with and planning for our infrastructure and our supplies. Good question, Mitch. I know the hour is late, but it's kind of a multi-pronged question. Ron, I guess you're up first. Just quickly, you talked about the deep water desal in Monterey County. Mm -hmm. you talked about a 15-mile pipeline. Yeah. How realistic is that, getting access to that, if that were an option down, down river, so to speak? Well, again, you know, as, as serious as the implication is, you don't want to take anything off the table unless it just costs you too much or there's, there's you know, some force to it as long as it's out there. I would say Monterey has its own set of uh, conditions that make, might make it, us look, look simple in a sense. So in, what I'm saying is they have a hierarchy of processes they're going through. They have pure water Monterey, which is first on the list. The second one is a Cal D cell. And Jonathan, help me, you know better than I do, you work down there. That if that happens, then I would say deep water D cell is much less likely to happen. If the Cal D cell doesn't happen, which is the second prong, then um, then maybe deep water diesel. So how about accessibility? 
a 15 mile uh, pipeline. You know, it's, it's, it's doable. It's, 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 it's in public right of way. It, it is. So yeah, it's access. doable. Yeah, we've, you know, our engineers have looked at it, costed it, and, uh, and like I said, it's in the. That doesn't the mean it's there. cheap. No. <laughs> okay, right. no. And, the, and the price of water is quite expensive. It actually doubled from when they first entered the MOI, so that's kind of backed us off a little bit. And then you mentioned the, the stormwater recharge option. If I understood you right, you just said that you guys identified just two or three spots that you found appropriate well, for we recharging looked, the Well, we place. looked out through a whole entire area, and when you start overlaying factors like runoff and suitability, you know, you may have to say the whole area looks good, then you go, well, it doesn't, it's too, it's too steep, so take that portion out, and what you end up with <coughs> is about 30 sites. And then from those 30 sites, other factors come into play. So it reduced down to about a handful of uh, sites, some of them on the golf course, which just went up for sale. So that, uh, mm -hmm. that threw a little, little monkey wrench into that, but we're still working on it. Mm -hmm. And then um, on the potable water reuse, <coughs> I know I was so close to my estimation. Of yeah, you didn't get a bottle. So close you to half, half credit, credit here, yes. 500 versus 100 yeah. million. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> I think you probably have more of these than you can get. <laughs> yeah. I can do trips to the moon if you want to. Oh, no, no, okay. okay. I won't okay. that one. Um, <laughs> in terms of the EIR, where are you in terms of narrowing down the likely location? That's a great question. Awesome. I, didn't, I didn't go into that, um, <coughs> but what we have in the EIR is called a component based EIR. So there's three potential sites for the facility. One is at City of Santa Cruz Wastewater Treatment Facility. One is near Chanticleer. I've been saying Santa Clara. So anyway, um, the, uh, and then the other one is uh, next to our facility. We own a piece of property. And it could even be split. Maybe tertiary treatment happens, let's say, down at the wastewater treatment facility, because that's part of your plan. And we just polish the water at one of these other two facilities. And then once that happens, it, it, uh, it gets purified at one of those sites. It, uh, there's uh, lines that go out toward uh, Cabrillo College. There's a couple spots along the way where the water would recharge, there'd be recharge wells. So, uh, and there's a couple extra just in case we over, over or underestimated the amount of recharge. And so it's, and then there's three pipeline routes, the, rail, the railroad, uh, Capitola Road and SoCal Frontage Road. So, trying to keep options open and see in the EIR what kind of might work best. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. I know I'm pushing my time limit here, but if I could ask Rosemary one. Is it appropriate, can I ask the Water for Santa Cruz presentation? I thought it was very good and thorough. Can you comment on that? I mean, you're already working. Are you sure you want me to? Well, just short. <laughs> I know they're getting the hours like, you're working oh, toward the 300 <laughs> acre feet. If I understand their plan, they just want to pump up those numbers and just bring a lot more. Can you just comment on there? Well, there, there are several issues in the, some of the presentations about the surface water transfers that are being proposed by others that are somewhat problematic. Um, one is the, the analysis that I showed you uh, in my presentation, as I said a little bit earlier, took every drop of water every day. It uses a much longer window. It doesn't pick 2017, which was one of the wettest years, and says how much water is in the, the North Coast sources in 2017, which is where that's centered. And, well, that's not where that comes from. It comes from a sort of average. But, but the analysis is based on a number of things. The slide that looked at... Um, that was in both of these presentations that looked at the um, availability of water in from the San Lorenzo, for example, in um, this last spring, uh, March and April, doesn't show that the bypass has changed from 20 CFS to 40 CFS. So the whole that pink part that's the or the part that's in that slide that's the um, that's the fish flows has gotten twice as big, and part of the reason that's gotten twice as big is because we, um, you know, we haven't really used Felton bypass for a really long time. And when we started talking to the fish agencies about what they would want in the bi in the reach between the Felton diversion and Tate Street, which we, where we normally take water out, there were issues about fish passage in the winter time upstream for spawning and what have you that had to be dealt with. So the bypass flow got twice as big, and that's not really taken into account here. 
Another thing is that if you're going to take the water, there's been a lot of talk about pipe sizes. You might have heard some of this, you know, build a bigger pipe. Well, if you build a bigger pipe and you're trying to send the water into the ground, like for aquifer storage and recovery or even for uh, ASR or in lieu, excuse me, um, the water has to be treated to drinking water standards. So if you build a bigger pipe, then you can't just build a 30 MGD pipe, you have to build a 30 MGD treatment plant. And you have to build the capacity of 30 million gallons in a, in a given day to put the water into the ground. So transmission to the facility, making the treatment plant bigger, putting the water in the ground. And if you're thinking about maximizing the sizing of, so that you can take every drop of water that's available that particular day, then you're maximizing costs too in a way that will make your eyes really get big. Um, and if you're, so what we're really looking at in our analysis is optimizing the project, recognizing that we have the variability that you've seen over 70 plus years of record that we have to find the sweet spot in there that's cost effective and still gives us, solves our problem. So it's, it's kind of a different approach to take to it. And I think that... Um, it goes on management of the lock, but it's so different. Pardon me? Management of the lock. Is yes, so and we, have, we do recognize that there are some issues that we, once we get additional storage in our system, we might operate the lock in a different, quite a different way. But, we haven't changed all the things about that in the way we've modeled this so far because we're not there yet. And so it's kind of in order to compare where you, where you might be going with where you've been, you can't change all the, all the parameters at once, right? So we're doing it in a little bit of a stepwise fashion. I think that there is, there is a reasonable assumption that there is water that would be available, whether it will ultimately be cost effective to do that and whether we can solve all of our problem or part of the problem, whether the member agencies in the community, the SoCal and Scotts Valley and San, um, San Lorenzo Valley might want to take our water. Those are all questions that, you know, there aren't, the uh, automatic answer isn't yes to. And not everybody would want to take water and or under the right circum you know, the circumstances. So, there's a whole bunch of things we're working on. We do have very good cooperative relationships with the other agencies. I think there's a lot of really good work going on on, on the river transfers. I think some parts of this could probably work, but it's not a simple question. And I, can I add one thing? Mm -hmm. So, right, uh, and I know Santa Cruz is doing mm -hmm. tremendous work on this, but right now it's not legal to take the San Lorenzo water and ship it to us. They can't even store it for more than 60 days and then pull it out. I think it's 60 days. So, and you think that, and, and I think that'll change, but it hasn't, and people have been working on it for a long time in a lot of different places, so it's not even legal. I just want to make that clear right now. It's, it's, the, bio, the I want to clarify that because that, you probably don't understand what that means when he says it's not legal. The water rights that we have for all of our San Lorenzo River rights have what are called places of use, established places of use, a map. And so Cal Creek, is not in the map of the established places of use of any of our San Lorenzo rights, which we have no creek rights on the Block Longman Reservoir. We have Felton diversion permits and we have Tate Street diversion rights. So that has to be fixed in order for us to really sort of maximize what we might be able to send. But again, their wintertime demand or their, their low demand limits what we could really get to them because it can't take more water that we, you know, through in lieu, for example, than they use. There's no place to put it. Well, but what about North Coast, though? Because there's different water. There's no water North Coast rights. has, is a pre-14 rights, appropriative water rights. They have, um, they do not have places of use in the traditional way. But they are, particularly Laguna, which is the biggest of those sources, has been fairly heavily dedicated to fish flows because of the watershed is in very good shape. And it has a long run before it has a sort of a natural blockage to fish passage. And the water quality is very good. And so it's a very healthy watershed. So a big chunk of our historic North Coast flows is not 
available for the city more dedicated for fish flows. We had a couple other questions here from Zappi and so just to broaden the conversation, you've been focusing on the uh, the big projects, which you know give you a lot of control, and there's big agencies involved. But just a question for John and maybe the private well pumpers: Is there consideration of recharge, smaller recharge projects, especially in the areas where we know that the recharge is good? Um. We are, we have been working with the Resource Conservation District on doing outreach to private well owners in terms of what they can do in terms of water use efficiency and also things they can do on their property to promote more infiltration. Um, I don't think there's a lot of big water there, but I think there's, you know, that's one of the ways to potentially offset the impacts of climate change with reduced recharge. We can capture more of those flows up in the hills and get them into the ground instead of running off, then I think we'll all benefit from that. So that is one of the things we're, we've been working on. It hasn't been baked into a plan yet. We don't have a target for how much water that might involve, but it's certainly something we want to keep looking at. But that could be a part of the uh, our sustainability plan. That's correct. It's, it's not, it's, it's a lot of little things that can add up. Right, right. Okay. So this has to do with the potable water reuse facility, um, wherever it winds up, if it happens, uh, to be located somewhere. I think you mentioned there's 8 million gallons a day of effluent. On and, average, yes. Uh, on average. And we would, you propose 25%, so 2 million. Yeah, we have a, a memorandum of understanding with the city of Santa Cruz, and that, that would leave enough for them if they ever decide to go that route. But it's enough for us, but yes. Okay, so we would have two million a day on average. Um, it's, it's close to that, not quite that. Something like yeah, that. Yeah, so yeah, it's close. Something like seven hundred million a yeah. year, which is what twenty five hundred acre feet. Uh, well, it's it's designed. The plan is designed for fifteen hundred acre feet. That's what uh, to that's what the overdraft problem. The portion that we mean we mean SoCal Creek Water District. However. I, an important component of the EIR is that the pipe is going to be much bigger to carry that water. So if it comes to being that some, you know, the NGA says, hey, we need to put more water through there, we're going to, we would, the proposal is not to put a pipe just to solve our portion of the problem, but big enough to, to solve other portions of the problem too. We don't want to put one, dig up that pipe twice. Right, yeah, so the 25%, that, that was chosen not arbitrarily, but so yeah. to have the capacity of at least 1,500. Exactly. Yep. Okay. And just to mention, you know, just so far that's the only one that is potentially dropped as we're looking at insurance. You know, some recycling or desalination. No. Yeah. And that 1,500 acre feet a year compares to what, 20 or 30 from recharge. Or my recharge is smaller quantity, but like yeah. perhaps if it's, oh, it's, it's a lot of smaller locations, it still could be done. Sure. Is there anyone else that has questions from either the advisory committee or the public? Yes, ma'am. Well, I did have a question related to um, needed clarification on the EIR. I haven't really got into the weeds on it yet, but I did look at the um, the, the um, the guidelines that were provided, the summary guidelines. And I looked at the alternatives, and alternative number two is, is the closest uh, that comes to describing um, the um, water, uh, water Supply Advisory Committee's uh, number one um, recommendation, that is the water, interagency water exchanges. And it's listed as an alternative but I was told, and I think by Mr. Duncan, that it wasn't an alternative, it was both. And in fact, your, um, your newsletter indicated that it wasn't, an, that these were not alternatives, these were all of the above, or both of those uh, options. That they would be done in conjunction with each other, both the, um, um, the Pure Water SoCal and 
of the water exchanges, the interagency mm -hmm. water exchanges. <coughs> you probably can see it as listed as an alternative. Um, so I think that probably needs to be clarified. Also in the description, um, it, it, uh, it says that uh, the city and the district would guarantee that water would be available during drought and non-drought conditions. That seems like a real high bar. Uh, it seems like a very rigid uh, condition to place on interagency exchanges when, when you don't know what Mother Nature is going to do. So I, I did like um, Ms. Menard's uh, uh, statement about the value of adaptability, and I think there needs to be some flexibility in, a, in some uh, agreement between the city and so yeah. So those are great comments, Jan. Thank you. And I, and I urge you to submit them to through the process, for the EIR process. But I'll respond. So when you do that, what you want to do with the EIR, if, if Pure Water Soquel is to produce 1,500 feet, you want comparable things that could produce the same amount. That's why you have to have the guarantee. It certainly doesn't mean if the board certified the EIR for 1,500 acre feet that we still couldn't take river water in addition to that. I mean, that's that's a that's an option that's always there. But the EIR has specific guidelines when you go through that kind of analysis that you got to compare apples to apples. But we have a community guide for, for members of the public here, which please see me if you want one tonight. Go on, it's online. Please submit comments. Anything you said tonight, you need to submit through the through the appropriate process. So I just want to be clear on that. I'm not writing your comments down. So. Please submit them or, or do it at our um, event coming up at the end of the month. Thank you. Okay, any other questions? Mm -hmm. right back there and then we'll go over to This is a short question. Is there anything in that way of being able to recharge an area? You know, that when I dump a big bucket of water, <laughs> it doesn't go into the ground so fast. You know, but is, is, is that something to think about in terms of the receptivity of where you're, where you're yeah. recharging? Okay. Yeah. The, the problem in most of this region is that it's pancake layer geology. There's, a, there's some sand and then there's a clay layer. And as soon as the water goes down and hits the clay layer, it, it goes horizontal. So it's hard to get water down in the Prisma, down in the Romus, where Central and Ralph's district and uh, Mr. Benich, that's more, it's sandy, the Romus red sands. And so it does, and those were those recharge areas that we were looking, uh, looking at. But our aquifers are like, Three, four hundred, five hundred feet down below the ground. The water supply. The water supply, of course. Thank you. But as, as Dr. Jaffe mentioned, the recharge areas for some of the charisma are up higher in the mountain, in the hill, <coughs> where we go. There could be some potential there. Right, where it outcrops in the recharge yeah. area. So it depends. It depends. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. That's all sand. Yep. Okay. It depends. <laughs> and then there was another question, Gary. Uh, I'd like to respond to the uh, questions of Rosemary about my talk. Um, on the on the spiky graph of the, the hydrograph of the, the river with the yellow strip across it, uh, where Rosemary said that the fish flows have uh, been uh, increased from uh, 20 CFS to 40, that's one percent of the, the the top spikes on the graph. That's a semi-log graph, and it affects the take uh, of the 30 MGD not at all. I mean, uh, imperceptibly because of the shape of the spike. Uh, secondly, um, when she said uh, earlier that um, you know, water transfers didn't look like they would uh, 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 satisfy Santa Cruz's demand, um, she was not quoting aquifer specs. She was quoting uh, uh, of, of the 10 fire hoses, Several of them are still crippled in her model. And I, I think uh, we owe it to ourselves to have a, a, a model or a, you know, a, a, a computation run, a convergence run done uh, with the actual lack of respect. Even Wasac hasn't done that yet, and it's a really crying shame. Because there's a lot of water there, and it really does work. Well, I'll let you work that out with the city of Santa Cruz, since that would be any, any water would have to come through that. So, are there any other questions? Yes. Thank you, Dr. Steinberger. Um, I first of all want to say that I scheduled two study sessions for the public to look over the so uh, 
Income Creek Water District, Pure Water SoCal Draft EIR. And there's a flyer out on the table. They'll both be at the Aptos Library. The first one is next Wednesday, and the second one will be August 8th, 6 to 8 p.m. There's a flyer on the back table. And the purpose is just to help people. It's a thick document, and it's daunting. And a lot of people have no idea where to begin or, or what to do. So it's to assist people who would like to join in but are not quite sure how. And there is a 20-page community handbook available for people. Yes, I've involved. seen that. The document itself is enlightening, though. Yeah. I have a question um, for Mr. Ricker. Um, in the recent um, modeling, was it included to, in, to uh, model the effects of shutting off the wells of SoCal Creek Water District? Um. I think you're referring to the modeling that we are going to be doing with yes. regards to looking at impacts on the stream flow. And we're, I don't think we're modeling shutting off all the wells, but we're looking at shutting off the wells that may be close to Soquel Creek and to see how that uh, affects the stream flow. Uh -huh. okay. okay, thank you. I have a question for Mr. Um, Either um, Ms. Menard or Mr. Duncan, I saw in the uh, piece about the uh, pilots, pilot study for the water transfers that Laguna Creek in the North Coast is not included. Can anybody explain to me why Laguna Creek is being excluded in the pilot study? I, oh, I know what you're saying. All right. So as I, um, there's been a question about where the 300 acre feet came from, the 100 million gallons. And I think in some other meeting I've made this comment. The 100 million gallons for the pilot was based on the average flow of Lydell, not Laguna because Laguna has been, as I said earlier, often dedicated completely, even in the winter time, to fish flows under certain conditions. So the idea was in order for us to sort of meet the standard of being assured that we didn't provide water from other sources than the North Coast, we just took that one piece and we said, let's use the small amount, let's start here, let's do this test, and if it is a successful test, we can figure it out, including dealing with the water rights place of use <coughs> issue that Ron mentioned and that we are, in fact, moving forward to address. So it's not that, like, Laguna was taken out because of the fish flow dedication and my need to be able to tell the state board that I had not given Soquel any more water than was produced by a source which has a very standard 1 million gallons a day flow. Protect the fish is the short answer. Well, it's not protect the fish. It was an accounting thing. But it was also for the fish. Okay. So, thank you for your question. Can I ask two more questions? Okay. Um, this is for SoCal Creek Water District. Um, are you going to allow your ratepayers and the private well owners who will be affected possibly by the impacts of these monitor of these uh, injection wells and possible contamination if things were to go awry? Are you going to allow them a chance to vote? at any point before you begin this project as to whether they would accept that risk and also your rate payers will be accepting a huge financial burden. Will you allow a vote? You know, that's a board decision, but I think with the community outreach we did and all the input, that was a vote of confidence. And also the survey where it indicated, I think it was 77% supported it. That's a good indication. Thank you. So you're not going to allow a public vote? That's a board decision at a later date. It's not part of the EIR process. I see. Thank you. Mm -hmm. My, um, last question. Last question is how will you verify the two-month state-required holding times for the water that is injected, if yeah. it is injected? That's a great, if it's recharged into the aquifer, first you do modeling, and then you go out and you put monitoring wells in, the state actually verify it. Usually the common ingredient unit is, I think, 
bromine, me, I think is what she used, and you actually put it in the recharge water. It's none. It's perfectly fine for humans and fish. We I've used it out and even in the ocean. And you actually put it in there and you measure down there to verify, empirically verify, the modeling estimates. So, so that's how you do it. You'll be using bromine? Not bromine. It's a, it's a, it's a, it's another, it's whatever the state tells asks us to use. Bromine. I was giving a, an example of where it's been, chemicals that have been used other places or, or ingredients. But it's a, it's a completely safe, that's mandated by the state board, to put in the well, then you you let it flow, and you have monitoring wells, physical monitoring wells, where you take samples out at designated times to see the travel time. So it's verified, the modeling estimates are verified empirically through measuring the flow and travel times. Okay. So, ladies and gentlemen, I think we have, um, our next meeting is here on September 20th, I think 7 p.m. Um, there is also a GSB advisory committee meeting also going to be here on August 27th. Okay. So until the next board meeting, thank you all very much. Good night.